Hello! Today I'm starting a new series called Unsung Heroes. This series is all about interviewing and recognising various people that you might not know about, but have made some truly amazing things. Today I want to introduce Demetrius, also known as Midwan, and the reason he's today's unsung hero is that he's the developer behind the popular Amiga emulator Amiberry, used by RetroPie, Pi Amiga, and the new A500 Mini. Hello Demetrius, how are you? Hi Rob, thanks for having me, I'm great, thanks. So, um, our first question I want to know is, um, where does the name Midwan come from? Well, that's kind of a long story. Um, remember back in the days when, when everybody in the Amiga scene had nicknames and uh, every demo coder or uh, every, everything we saw online, basically before the online age actually, everybody had a nickname. Mm -hmm. So it was so cool to have a nickname. <laughs> uh, back then, w when I started doing some Amiga creations of my own, mostly little small little demos or things like that, I, I decided, okay, all the cool guys have a nickname, I need to find one. So at that time, I remember that I really, really liked a game on the arcades called Midnight Wanderers. It was part of a triple game. One of them was Midnight Wanderers. So the name just stuck because I just, I just took the first three letters of both words and I came up with mid one, which was kind of unique, nobody else had that. It didn't really mean anything by itself. So I was able to use it on everywhere, you know, emails, uh, nicknames, mm -hmm. even an IRC later on. And it, it stuck with me all through all these years. Ah, cool. So what was your first experience with computers or gaming? Well, computers and gaming, they, they were not the same thing. They were not at the same time. My first experience with gaming was one of those old Atari's 2600 that you could mm -hmm. hook up on the TV and it was really, really primitive and very blocky graphics and really ugly sound and all that, but still super excited when you were as a kid. Um, but regarding computers, I think the first one that I actually laid hands on was an Amstrad CPC 6128. Uh, green screen, 8-bit chip sound, you know the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't mine, it was one of my cousin's com computer that, that I just happened to visit one day and I got hooked right away. And that, that was the first attempt of actually seeing how a computer works and what you can do with it. Uh, it came with BASIC out of the box, so you could do some BASIC stuff there, but you could also run games and the games were much, much better than the Atari one. So I think that's what started the ball running after that. Hmm. So um, we obviously know that you're an Amiga fan. Um... Do you still own any original hardware? <laughs> More than I can fit in my room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do. I, I own all the hardware I ever bought, plus more. Um, I, I have my original 500, which was my first Amiga I ever had. And after that, I, uh, I bought a 4000 a desktop, which I still have next to me. And it's still the main Amiga that I use whenever I turn it on. I've kept expanding it over the years, you know, adding capabilities to it, USB ports, uh, Ethernet ports, graphics cards, as, as much as I could to keep it up to date. Then I have then several 1200s that I salvaged or inherited, um, another 4000 that I, I saved from the trash bin a few years ago, and then I also got a vampire, but I'm not sure if that counts as an Amiga. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I have uh, I have the f almost the full range of vampires, actually. I have the standalone, I have the 1200 version, and I have the 600 version. Um, I don't have the 500 version, but I don't think I need that one as well, right? <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's quite a collection, that is. Um, but the one thing I hear you haven't got is the A500 Mini, which has been released and has received some positive and some negative, especially regarding the fact that we've learned that it uses Amiberry. What's your thoughts on that? As any Amiga product, I'm happy to see it. Uh, I'm, and I wish the best success in it. Um, I, I wasn't even aware it was running Amiberry until recently, when uh, I came in touch with uh, the company behind it. But, but after that, we started collaborating on exchanging ideas on how to bring it up to speed and um, come up with the latest version of Amiberry to run on it, for example, which is planned to happen in the future. Uh, and um, helping retro games also come out with the necessary steps towards um, to, to comply with the GPL. You know, they have to 
publish their repository, which they have done a few days ago. Um, they also have to publish a toolkit and the instructions necessary in order to build your own version, uh, modify it and build your own and then run it on the device. Uh, which would be the first step in order to allow me as well to build versions of Amiberry for it going forward. And we are discussing the best way to go forward with that. They will need a little bit more time. I think we're, we're waiting on them to do that step as well. Uh, but we, we came up with a um, plan for the future and how to hopefully merge those two code bases and come up with a single Amiberry version going forward. Hopefully that will make things better for everyone. That's good. Good. So you're in contact with them and things are moving nicely. That's good. Mm -hmm. So um, Ambiberry though, what, what gave you the idea to fork it? Because it was originally part of uh, UAE for uh, ARM, wasn't it? That's correct. Um, when I, I think it was back in 2015 or 2016. Well, it was 2016 when Ambiberry became Ambiberry. But the, my interest in, in the emulator on Raspberry Pi was started around that time or maybe a year later or a few months later, uh, earlier, sorry. Um, when, I, when the Raspberry Pi, or the original Raspberry Pi came out, I thought, ooh, it's a great device to do little, little gadgets or little uh, small cost, low cost uh, solutions. But it wasn't really powerful enough. It wasn't until the Pi 2 came out where it started becoming a bit more interesting. And then when the Pi 3 eventually came out, it was good enough to run m most of the games uh, full speed. So during the, the time of the Pi 2, and I think it was around the time when Pi 3 also came, I'm, I'm not sure about the years, it was around that time. Uh, I had a Pi 2 and I remember I was go waiting for a Pi 3. I discovered that there were several Linux distributions that were coming out with the intention of having something minimal just putting into the emulator. I thought, that's a great idea. I always wanted to do something like that as well. I was thinking, I had the impression of Amithlon, if you remember from back in the years, uh, mm -hmm. when you had a, a very, very minimal Linux kernel booting directly into Workbench with RTG support and JIT compiler for the CPU. So it was super fast and you could almost fake yourself thinking that it's a real Amiga. Um, and I thought, what a great idea would be to, to do the same thing on a Raspberry Pi, because Amithlon was quite old. A Raspberry Pi is quite new. Uh, it's very cheap. It's a single hardware. You don't have to worry about modifications, you know, different cards, different uh, models of this, different models of that, which was also a pain in, in Amithlon. So it's a, it's a same platform everywhere, very affordable. Wouldn't it be great if we could make it into an Amiga, but without having the hassle of, you know, loading the full operating system and then go through all those, like you do with Windows. You have to wait, load up Windows, then you have to load up the emulator on top of that and then run whatever you wanted. Wouldn't it be great if we could have a minimal setup, like just the bare essentials and then boot into the emulator directly? So I started finding the, some groups online that were doing just that and they were dedicated to just that and several projects that started up during that time that were trying to achieve exactly the same thing, which was great because there was a lot of uh, innovation, a lot of exchange of ideas and um, a lot of different approaches also that I, you could see there. So I started testing out and I, the first one that I found that was closer to what I wanted to, to get to was um, Amibian. Um, that was done by Gunnar, um, Gunnar Christiansson. Mm -hmm. And originally I just thought, what, this is perfect. This is great. This is all I want. And then as soon as I upgraded the system and it stopped working, I thought, well, maybe it's not perfect yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I started trying to help out and trying to make it better. Um, we saw that there were a lot of issues in, in several places. Uh, there were issues in the distro part and then there were issues in the emulator part. So uh, I worked a little bit on my own to try to improve the distro part. I made a, a little script that was the, the original Ami, Amiberry name actually, but nobody has to know that necessarily. <laughs> uh, it wasn't an emulator originally, which was to my regret, this was the, the cause of a lot of confusion later on. Um, so my original version was just a script that would take down um, a, a Linux distribution basically for, for the Raspberry Pi and strip it down to the bare essentials, get the emulator running and also configure it so that it boots into the emulator as fast as possible. And by as fast as possible, I'm talking, I had actual, actual benchmarks. It was maybe a, a second and a half after, after you powered it on, you were in the emulator, something like that. 
So it was the best I could I uh, could do based on everything I gathered, all the knowledge I gathered around from the different uh, people and the different ideas. And I, I merged different people's ideas into one solution that I, I, I just tried to borrow the best idea from each one and make it into one. And then I made it into a, a public script on GitHub that everybody could get and do it themselves uh, with the intention of, of giving it to Gunnar, of course, and helping him make Amibian even better. Mm. Um, as soon as we did that, and I thought, okay, if we if we do it like this, at least the, the distro remains stable. You can still do updates. You can still move it forward without breaking everything if you, if you had it customized everything by hand. But as soon as that was done, I started noticing all the other problems with the emulator itself. So uh, I thought, okay, I don't really have a lot of experience on C++, so I can't really just take over, but maybe I can help here and there. I have some experience. Mm -hmm. uh, that emulator was done by Chips, um, so I started um, reaching out to him on GitHub, uh, reporting the bugs I found and trying to help out, you know, first of all by just bug reporting and see if we can fix these things. Um, unfortunately, he was a bit slow to respond, slower than my taste at least. So I thought, okay, but I have a big number of things I'd like to move forward with. Um, I understand if he's too busy to do them, of course, or maybe he's not interested in doing them. So maybe I should just fork it and try to do that myself and see how that goes. Mm. And uh, that's how it started. That's how Amiberry started. I forked that project and then I started implementing all the ideas I had and how to move it forward. And uh, it kind of got its own life. Uh, there were a lot of things then that were completely replaced. The, 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 it started with small things. Like, oh, if I do this, I get a black screen and it crashes. Can we fix that? And eventually it started having its own project scope and uh, grander ideas go going forward. Things like, uh, we should replace STL1 with STL2, really. If we want to move to the future so we get hardware acceleration for, mm. for a number of things. Better controller support and a bunch of things like that. Uh, with that came the GUI rewrite because then the, the GUI that was used in STL1 was an older one. There was a different one that we had to upgrade to, to use under STL2. But uh, STL2 opened up a huge number of possibilities after that because all of a sudden it could be multi-platform. You don't have to be restricted on mm. Raspberry Pi and Discman X only. You can now run it on a desktop eventually. So one thing brought another and here we are, I don't know, six years later. <laughs> Yeah, and it's um, um, and you've you've yeah. achieved the goal of having it so it's it boots up really quickly because now we have things like Pymega and um, well mm -hmm. RetroPy and it's all built in. It's very very quick and great for everybody. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's but, working well. Uh, I, but I had to I had to switch focus essentially. At, at that point, I thought, okay, I, I can't really be doing both the distribution mm -hmm. and the emulator, and that's not my intention. I want just the experience to be as good as possible, but. There are so many people out there doing distributions that I don't, I shouldn't be doing that. Mm. Uh, there were too many already. They were, some of them had gone away, some of them uh, faded out, some of them persisted, and some of them just matured and improved. So I thought there's no point for me just doing an, what, yet another one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in, instead, let's try to make the emulator as good as possible so it can run on all of these. Mm. So I started focusing towards that mostly, which was a, um, a really great opportunity for me to become better at C++ also. <laughs> <laughs> that I always wanted to. So it was a learning experience at the same time, um, but uh, a really, really painful it in sometimes because you have to go through legacy code that has been there from a lot of people before you, and you have to keep doing things the same way, otherwise you risk breaking things. One, one of the main reasons I wanted to keep Amiberry up to date is, is to be able to sync as much as possible with WinUA because the, all the new stuff comes from there and if you change too much then it, it will be a pain in the butt all the all the time to try to sync in the new changes so I, over the years I've tried to bring it closer and closer to WinUA standard code in as many things as possible still having to keep some things separate due to performance reasons I mean, but as, as new Raspberry Pis come out and new platforms come out which are faster then we can afford to spend a few more cycles and be more accurate and go a little bit closer to WinUE as well. So that's what's been happening and some people you know have been complaining about that from time to time. Oh the older version was a bit faster. <laughs> yes but it had bugs and we couldn't fix them <laughs> until the end. We had, we had to make a choice at some point. There were some routines that were um, too faster because they were using ARM assembly, but good luck debugging that one. 
<laughs> when it had when it had bugs under certain weird conditions. Mm. Uh, instead, we get we switched over to the C routines that WinUA uses. The bugs are gone, but it's a bit slower. It's always um, a tricky balance between those two. Yeah. So, what would you say was your favorite memory of working on oh, Ami Berry so far? By far, the the favorite. It's not just a memory. It's it's still today. It's it is the feedback from people. Mm. Um, simple feedback like, "Hey, this reminded me of my childhood." That means a lot to me. I mean, we don't do this for the money, obviously. Uh, there are countless hours spent on this thing every afternoon of my life, mostly after 2016, <laughs> give or take. Um, and that, that cannot be repaid by any monetary uh, method. But uh, what we do it for is, first of all, because we like it, obviously. Otherwise, it's, if it stops being fun, we, we stop doing it. But then for me, it's also the feedback from people. Uh, that it helps them get their little nostalgia trip. Most of them are, you know, my age or older, more or less. Uh, they have families now, they, they have their own life, they have their own business, and all of a sudden they come up with a method, a, a easy and accessible and affordable method, because it's also important. They don't have to shell out, you know, 400, 500 euros to get something. Mm. Um, they can just have a Raspberry Pi plug in something and they can play their favorite old games and that takes them back a few years and sometimes they tell me that oh yeah this was a great introduction to show to my kids how we used to do things back in the day and those things are precious to me they, they mm. are i'd say that's the best part so um i presume then you don't do this full time and you actually maybe have some other job that you do it has to pay the rent doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I have a full-time job. I'm a software developer by trade and I do that full-time and then on my spare time I still do software development. What does that say about me? <laughs> <laughs> well, from my experience, the better ones are always the ones that want to do it when they go home as well. So. Yeah. Well, my, my wife might disagree, but... <laughs> <laughs> So, um, aside from Amiberry, I, um, I know you're into ray tracing, so um, can you tell mm -hmm. me a bit about that? Yeah, um, actually it's not me that's that much into ray tracing. Uh, a friend of mine is the nutcase about it, <laughs> and he has kind of dragged me along for it. Um, and I'm talking about you, Muadib, you know who you are. So, this guy, uh, we met back in the day, back in, I think, 97? 1997 let me take you for the nostalgia trip now uh, we were i was responsible together with a few other people of organizing certain events that were happening back then um, i was living in greece back then and we had a series of events that we started up called ami gatherings so we had ami gathering number two happening in 97 where we gathered a lot of people all over Greece uh, coming into the same place. It, it was like more like a modern demo party, but uh, without the intention of competitions or anything like that. More like getting together, having fun, exchanging ideas and creations, going out for a beer afterwards, that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, it was the time of IRC, so it was a chance to meet up. Uh, otherwise, we didn't know each other. So back at that time, um, this guy shows up. Uh, with his trusty 1200, <laughs> which with a No60 accelerator inside, one of the few people that had that, that back then. And because he was constantly running Lightwave, rendering scenes that would take a lifetime, he had a big fan underneath it. And <laughs> in order to have some airflow, he had placed his 1200 on top of cassette tapes, <laughs> the covers of cassette tapes, so four on each side or something. So it was lifted up. A big fan underneath, noisy as hell, and <laughs> rendering Lightwave all the time. So we were just curious, what is this guy doing here? It's just, what are you doing? <laughs> and he, since then, I think he became known as the Lightwave master for us, at least in our circle. <laughs> he, he devoted his whole life, I guess, on this thing, even up to today. He still uses Lightwave on the Amiga. He still persists that it's more creative for him to have a restricted environment to do things. It forces him to be more creative and think differently and with, within the limits of, of those restrictions. So he still does that and he actually started a, an online course um, last year with uh, showing um, something I've been pushing for him to do for a long time now. Uh, he has a lot of skills he, he has acquired and a lot of knowledge he has acquired over the years. Uh, so I thought, wouldn't it be great if you just you bring that out? You know, hmm. Teach people how to do things that you know how to do and nobody else seems to do. Uh, so he started a course 
Amiga Lightwave Tutorials. Um, no, it's not the exact title, but he started that on and through Patreon last year. It was going on for a while, then he had a kid and he had to take a pause for a while. But uh, I'm hoping it will resume. So it was because of him that I was dragged into the Lightwave scene, essentially. <laughs> Otherwise, I would just play around with it and leave it. And uh, he was also the main motivator for one of our little Amiberry side projects. Since he's still rendering on his original 1200, plus, you know, a Win UAE instance here and there, mm -hmm. he was asking me, isn't there a way to make this thing go faster? Maybe we can use a Raspberry Pi for that. And all of a sudden, I had a few light bulbs coming, and pling, pling. <laughs> <laughs> And started thinking, how can we do that? Let me see. Hmm, Lightwave had a feature called ScreamerNet, which allowed you to have a render farm. And the way this used to work back in the day in the 90s, where you barely even had any, any network, <laughs> <laughs> is that it was really, really primitive. You just had a shared folder somewhere, uh, a network folder, and everybody was reading and writing files to that folder <laughs> between the different machines. And the files were basically uh, two files for each instance. One was um, an acknowledgement file and another one was the command file. So Lightwave, the, the master installation of Lightwave would write out commands to each one of them. They would pick up the command, do the task, come back with an acknowledgement and just write a file there mm -hmm. saying, I did that, and then they would get the next command. So it was really, really primitive and really simple. So we started thinking, how can we do this on a Raspberry Pi? Well, obviously you just run Amiberry on it and it's super, super fast if you run it with a JIT emulator. Mm. But let's take it a step further. How can we do this without any human interaction if possible? Otherwise you normally just have to manually run it and give it commands for each instance and all that. So we, we came up with a little, um, after experimenting and going back and forth and a little brainstorming, I came up with a solution with a minimal ARRAS installation so it can be freely distributed. Um, so it just contains the basic things, Amiga DOS shell only, it boots up and it has a little uh, startup uh, sequence that runs a little Amiga DOS shell uh, that tries to detect, you know, which node am I, which is the next free available node, and it takes itself uh, up from there and then starts pushing out commands or picking up commands and pushing out acknowledged files after that. So you could easily stack up as many Raspberry Pis as you want, or as many as Lightwave allows, really, mm -hmm. which is, I think, 99, if I'm not mistaken, up to 99 nodes in total, all over, in, over a network. Even distributed network, because the way we designed this is we tried to make it work over TCP IP, even though that wasn't the original design. <laughs> we tried to take it a step further and we said, okay, well, let's see, try Samba, try NetFS, try different ways to see how that would make that shared volume available. The best way eventually was to use the Linux system underneath, which was more reliable than the Amiga version of it, uh, to mount the remote volume locally. And then it doesn't matter where that remote volume is, mm -hmm. as long as you have access to it. It can be in somebody else's house. So you, we, we did that experiment and we ended up, um, I had a stack of four Raspberry Pis here, for example, rendering scene, rent frame after frame for him. And he had his own stack there and we could share. So he, whenever he, he wanted to, to compile or to render a bi really, really big scene, then it was just fire up the Pis, wait a few seconds until everything's ready, click on the button and let them get the job and render it. And the fun part, the Amiga is still the master. The real <laughs> Amiga was actually giving them the jobs. You render this scene, I'll wait here. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, I like that. <laughs> it was a really, really fun thing to do for me. A really challenge and kind of unique. I don't think anybody else had tried that before. Mm. No, I can't imagine they would have done. <laughs> yeah. Probably useless for most people these days, but still fun. <laughs> so are, um, are there any other projects that you're, um, you're involved in or working on? Um, too many, but the, the problem is that you, you can't focus on all of them at the same time. So I tend to switch from one to the other. And the main one has been Amiberry for a long time. And that's why I wanted to take a little breath from it to take a little pause and try something else for a while. It, it helps also with keeping your brain sane. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so version 5.1 that came out recently is well, I'm planning it for it to be, you never know, to be uh, uh, the same for, for a while, maybe a few months at least. Mm -hmm. So I can have a chance to go in and look into something else. I have been doing some Amiga projects or I want to do in some more some of some of the Amiga projects that I have in my mind. Uh, I helped out with iGame a bit in the past. 
there were a few things there as usual that I had as, as ideas and I wanted to implement. So I started doing it and sending pull requests over to Mr. Zambler. Mm -hmm. um, there were a few other projects that I wanted to do and I haven't really had a chance to do much yet. Um, the, are you aware of the ZZ9000 graphics card? I'm not, no. Well, it's an open source Amiga graphics card right. that came out for the big box Amigas. It's a Zoro slot card. And the good thing about it is that, hey, it has an ARM processor on it. Ah, I can see where this is going. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I thought, hey, I, I already have some knowledge about that. Let's see if I can merge or bridge those two things together and see if I can make it do something more. And it has an SDK. It, it's a bit primitive, but it's expanding. And being open source, you have everything you need to do there. So all you need to do is just spend time, learn and do it. So there are a lot of possibilities to do things with that one that I haven't really explored. And I have it right next to me on my 4000 waiting. Mm -hmm. And just recently, uh, Lucas, the, the guy behind that, uh, the company's MNT, by the way, uh, the, the came out with a sound card expansion for the same thing, oh. which, you know, adds some few extra capabilities, a DSP chip, you can do hardware decoding of MP3s and AHI drivers. So little things like that, that I would also want to spend some time and see if I can uh, do something nice with it. Um, then there was another project that I found out, the, the Solas project, which Rob uh, in Ireland is, uh, well, actually he's in Scotland, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> uh, he's been doing that and that's also a fantastic little thing it's a board that lets you hook up and control leds and it also has some custom sensors like um, two temperature sensors for example mm -hmm. and you can do some little cool things with it like uh, even have an lcd screen popping up information mm -hmm. but you can also program the leds uh, the way you want so i thought i would like to do some things with that one as well maybe go do something more with iGame and uh, there are still some features there that are not implemented like I'd like it to be able to open up LHA archives the same way that Amiberry does mm. and I'd like it to be able to update the slaves directly from the WST load site which are all ideas that were there for years and I was just thinking probably somebody will do that by the time I get there <laughs> but, but it hasn't happened yet so <laughs> Maybe I'll go back into that and do something. And there's also, you know, there's this constant being developers. We, we need to stay up to date with what comes out. And so there's also this constant search about what new technologies out are out there, what new tools are out there. Can I use any of these to, for any cool projects? So mm -hmm. there is one idea that I will not say much about for now because it, I don't even really sure if it's going to happen. But it has been in my mind for a few years and I just started playing around with it. And the aim is to make it a, a multi-platform thing for the first time to make it work on all the things, even on Raspberry Pi. Okay. Maybe, maybe not on an Amiga itself, it will probably be too slow there. <laughs> and hopefully tie it in with Amiberry as well, we'll see. Okay. It's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting idea that I've had and I have a proof of concept that already works, but it still needs a lot of work and it's an excuse for me basically to learn a few tools that I haven't played around with before. So there's too many, too, too many projects, not enough time. <laughs> We'll have to keep our eyes out for that one. <laughs> well, speaking of not enough time, when you actually manage to finally pull yourself away from the computer, what would you like to get up to? What do you mean get away from the computer? <laughs> 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 no, just kidding. There is, there are a few interests. When, when it's sunny outside, it's much more easy. Uh, when it's, if the weather is bad, it, you tend to want to stay inside. So then you, you have a gazillion number of things to do there. So it's, it's easy to, to do things on the computer. But if it's sunny outside, you start thinking maybe I should go out for a walk. You know. Uh, but, but besides joking, I have a few other interests like motorcycles. I've mm -hmm. had. Um, they have been a big part of my life since. 2000 basically when i started learning how to ride them <laughs> um I, I went to a school and eventually became a coach in that school the the school is the california superbike school it's a worldwide uh, school for riding techniques and improving your skills on riding and all that mm -hmm. uh, which was a huge eye-opener about how things work um, and i wanted to give back to this to the community so i, I became a coach and Officially still am, but haven't been doing it the last few years at least, uh, to help other people also write safer and write better and become the best of what they, of what they, of what they are. Um, so that, that's all, also one of the interests that can drag me away from the computer mm. in a way. And, and then there are other things that I always wanted to do, but I always scratch the surface and, and then abandon them. Things like learning to play the guitar better. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's things that I have two guitars there waiting for me and just an excuse to find some time and sit down <laughs> and do that. Um, I'm also a big fan of, of really, really nice computer games, but that's not getting away from the computer, of course, so I won't mention that. <laughs> Um, board games I like as well. It, there are some that I really, really love and I like to play with my son here. Mm -hmm. And generally, I'd say other activities I have depends on, on the on the company most of the time. Uh, there are lots of things I would enjoy doing with the right company. Mm -hmm. uh, but nowadays, especially after the phase of the pandemic, we, we kind of isolated more. Mm. So we, we switched to doing things more... Well, on a computer, exactly. remotely, <laughs> which is which is good in a way because you still get to keep in touch with people you wouldn't otherwise. Mm. And uh, also, as I've been moving from city to city and even from country to country over the years, so I, I kind of got used to keeping in touch with most of my friends using this method. So for me, it's okay. It's still the same thing. It doesn't matter if I just change to a different country or a different city. I still have the same way of communicating with people. But I know that for us, for some other people, this can be troublesome. So um, is there any particular favorite book or podcast or something like that you, you listen to regularly? Or? Well, uh, lots, but uh, podcasts, not that many actually, because lack of time, not nothing other in particular. <laughs> Um, if I start doing that also, then I will have even more, even less time to sleep, so I don't think that will be good for my health. <laughs> uh, but books, I, I've tried, I have phases where I read like a maniac and I don't stop, and then I have phases where I take a break for, um, for months and I don't read anything. Mm -hmm. um, I just finished the Expanse series, which was great science fiction, one of the best I've, I've read. Mm -hmm. And um, generally, I do like science fiction with the emphasis on science. <laughs> <laughs> Not that much on the fiction. Uh, it, it goes the same with, with TV series or movies and all that. Uh, for some reason, if they mess up the science part, it feels wasted for me. <laughs> I don't know. I, it, unbelievable. Like, why? Why did you do that? Um, so the, the last ones I've been reading was, was the Expanse series. I just finished them a um, few weeks ago. And I'm planning to pick up the next one, but I'm, I'm not really sure what that will be yet. Uh, I'm a big fan of Carl Sagan's books, all of them. They are fantastic and I think it's a must read for everyone mm -hmm. in today's world. And generally try to keep up with the latest uh, things in science, as you probably noticed. Physics based, astronomy based, um, as much as I can. It's, I, I found those uh, aspects fascinating in generally. If you could go back in time and give your 18 year old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Um... I guess it will be one of those cliches, don't pay any attention to what the others say, just keep following what you want to do. Because that still affects you even when you're 18. You still worry about what your people, the people around you will say about things and if they'll make fun of you about something because you still love that something and it's, you're the only one doing it. Uh, I, re I remember back then, for instance, I had an interest in, interest in computers and almost nobody else had uh, around me. So I was the odd one out. And as a kid, you don't want to be the odd one out. You want to belong to the tribe. Uh, otherwise, you feel, you know, they, they might treat you differently also. Mm -hmm. There was some, some uh, sort of bullying going on in, the, in small communities where I grew up. And it doesn't feel very good, which leads you to isolate more and leads you to be more careful with social contacts as well, which cost me a lot later on with relationships and it took me a while to work that out. So I'll probably, I, I think that's what I would say, mm -hmm. pay no attention, something like that. <laughs> good answer. <laughs> so um, how can anyone get in touch with you if they want to support your work? Um, um, easy to find, I hope. Uh, I can be found on multiple platforms. I try to be available everywhere I can, reasonably. Um, so I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Discord, in multiple servers, I'm on GitHub. Uh, if it's about Amiberry, I'd say the best place would be GitHub. There's a discussions page there, there's an issues page there where you can do one or the other if you want. Um, there are also links there if you want to support the project financially uh, with multiple ways. Uh, I don't think there is one way that fits all. It would be different for each person. Uh, some people also might want to do that on a monthly basis, some want to do it on a one-off basis. It's fine either way. Uh, mm -hmm. um, all of it is much appreciated. And we'll put the links to all that in the description in the video. Yep. Final question. Now that you've been given the soon-to-be-much-coveted Unsung Hero Award, is there anyone you'd like to nominate for a future Unsung Hero? Well, that one will need some thought. But <laughs> I, I would... 
<laughs> <laughs> Ooh, there's too many. Well, um, I would probably nominate Dom at this point. Dom mm -hmm. Cresswell. Uh, he made the WSD load booter what it is, and uh, he has helped a lot with supporting it and keeping it alive all through all these years, even though he took a little break in between. Mm -hmm. And you, I don't think he gets enough credit, obviously, for what he has done. Um, it's true that this was a collaborative effort. I, I keep maintaining it and I have evolved it further, but still he is the father of it and he still maintains the XML that the whole thing works with, um, mm -hmm. the basis of where the settings come from. And he's doing a great job in keeping the whole thing together. So I would probably nominate him. Okay, hopefully we'll see him on a future video, which would be nice. That would be great. I want to thank you for your time today. It's been really, really nice to speak to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.